Corrupting the Image by Douglas Hamp. Copyright 2011. All rights reserved. Chapter 4. Reborn with the Seed of the Messiah. In Isaiah 53.10, we are given a very important aspect of our salvation. We see that the Lord was pleased to bruise the Messiah and offer him up for our sakes. The text goes on to say that he shall see his seed. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, Zerah. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Isaiah 53.10 The Hebrew word used for seed, some translations say offspring, is Zerah, which is the same word that we looked at concerning the physical and biological offspring, children, of Abraham and David. The word very much meant someone who is descended from another. The question then obviously is how could the Lord Jesus have seed? While the Gnostic Gospels suggest that Jesus had sexual relations with Mary Magdalene and consequently had children, such talk is considered to be extremely heretical and anti-biblical. How then can the text have be taken literally since it is not referring to the Lord having physical relations with a woman? The answer is found in 1 John 3.9 and in 1 Peter 1.23 both of which refer to God having seed. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed, sperma, remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. 1 John 3.9 1 John 3.9 states clearly that God's seed, sperma, is in the believer because he has been born again. Said another way, one who is born again has God's seed inside him. That means that all true believers have God's seed in them. Peter confirms this when he says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word, logos, of God, which lives and abides forever. 1 Peter 1.23 Peter adds that the quality of the seed is not perishable, pthartos, but is imperishable, aphthartos. The living and abiding word of God must refer to the Lord Jesus himself, and not merely the text of the Bible, since the term Logos is used just like in John 1.1, 1, 1, which declares the Logos to be the one who created everything. John confirms being born of God in his first epistle when he says, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. 1 John 2.29 This statement is then restated. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. 1 John 5.18 Reborn with a new image. The fact that we are born again through the word of God points us back to Isaiah 53.10, which states that the suffering servant will see his seed. We are indeed born of God's, or Messiah's, seed, which is why we are able to have part in the age to come. Jesus could not have stressed this enough with Nicodemus when he said that we must be born from above, and if we are not, then we will not have a part in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus wasn't just speaking allegorically. In fact, now with an understanding of information technology, and also genetics and DNA, we can begin to grasp just a bit of what is going to occur when we come into the Lord's presence. Here and now, our DNA remains corrupted. But we who are trusting in the Lord are given the Holy Spirit as a down payment. When we, through the rapture or death, enter into the Lord's presence, we will be given our new bodies, which will still be us, but our DNA, our non-material information, will be repaired. In fact, from all that we have gained so far, we can conclude that we will literally be mingled, our DNA information combined, with the Lord, for only his seed is imperishable, incorruptible. Paul greatly elaborates on this in 1 Corinthians 15, which he, we have examined already. We must be combined with his seed so that we can be like him and be with him forever. It would seem obvious that man and his seed are perishable and corrupted. The fact that everyone eventually dies is proof that man's seed is perishable, but God's seed is incorruptible. Reborn as a son of God. At this point, we need to follow the thread of sons of God throughout the New Testament as it pertains to the believer. We will deal with the Old Testament reference to the sons of God in part 2. Scripture demonstrates that sons of God are in fact direct creations of God. From Luke, we learn that Adam was a son of God. Luke 3.23 gives the genealogy of Jesus in order to show that he is the promised redeemer.
Luke traces his lineage through David and sons, then back to Judah, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, Shem, Noah, and even Adam. Luke begins. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jana, the son of Joseph. Luke 3.23-24. Luke shows that each person was a son of so-and-so. Heli was the son of Mathat, who was the son of Levi, who was the son of Melchi, and so on. He finishes the genealogy by arriving at the beginning of time, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Luke 3.38. Enos was the son of Seth, who was the son of Adam, who was the son of God. Thus, Adam is declared to be the son of God by Luke. You and I are not naturally born sons of God. We are naturally born sons of Adam, for that is ultimately who our father is. We are not direct creations of God, but a procreation of our mother and father, who were in turn a procreation of their mothers and fathers, all the way back to Adam. Thus, we are truly sons of Adam. Thus far we can deduce that the term Son of God is used for beings that are direct creations of God. This conclusion is shared by biblical scholar E. W. Bollinger who states, It is only by the divine specific act of creation that any created being can be called a Son of God. For that which is born of the flesh is flesh. God is spirit, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. John 3.6 Hence Adam is called a Son of God in Luke 3.38. Those in Christ, having the new nature, which is by the direct creation of God, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Ephesians 2.10, can be and are called sons of God, John 1.13, Romans 8.14, and 15, 1 John 3.1. This is why angels are called sons of God in every other place where the expression is used in the Old Testament, Job 1.6, 2.1, 38.7, Psalm 29.1, 89.6, Daniel 3.25, no article. We, are, we have no authority or right to take the expression in Genesis 6.4 in any other sense. Moreover, in Genesis 6.2, the Septuagint renders it angels, the Companion Bible, Appendix 23, Emphasis Mine. End quote. Adam, of course, was made in the image and likeness of God. Since the term Son of God is used for angels, it would seem that they share the image and likeness of God. The main difference between them and Adam as we have examined, would be that the angels were created as spirits, whereas Adam was made of the dust, and God's breath, Holy Spirit, was breathed into him. Just who is a son of God? The scriptures reveal that sons of God are specifically a direct creation of God. Jesus is referred to as the only begotten, monogenes, or unique son of God, and so falls into another category. See discussion on the triune nature of God in Appendix 1. Nevertheless, the term is used to speak of beings that were specifically created directly by the hand of God. Let's consider the following. On the sixth day, God created Adam. Adam has no human father. Rather, he is the father of all subsequent humans. Hence, all of the descendants of Adam, that includes every person that has and will ever live, are by nature sons and daughters of Adam. This is exactly what the Hebrew scriptures call all humans, b'nai Adam, sons and daughters of Adam, for that is what we are. Thus, to be human is to be a Ben Adam, or son of Adam. And Adam was, of course, not a son of Adam, for that would be an oxymoron. Adam was, as Luke says, a son of God, to Theu. The common thread between Adam, as a son of God, and the sons of God in the Old Testament, are not that all are human, or sons of Adam, in fact, none of them is. The common thread is that they are all direct creations of God. How to become a Ben Elohim. What about the New Testament references to the believer as sons of God? Wouldn't it seem to contradict the conclusion we have just reached? Actually, the contrary is the case. The primary purpose Jesus had in coming to earth was to make it possible for us to become sons of God. In the Gospel of John we read, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 1 John 12-13 through 13. What we see here is that we who were naturally born as sons or daughters of Adam, B'nai Adam, have the possibility of becoming B'nai Elohim, children or sons of God. The power does not lie in us, it is by God's will and not man's. This 
converse, this conversion to a son of God is not through blood on a physical level, but to those that received him and have believed in his name. John's summary statement is evidenced in Jesus' words to Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel who came to Jesus one evening to learn what was required to be part of the kingdom of God. Jesus reproved him for not already knowing what was contained in the scriptures. Jesus replied to him, Truly, truly, I tell you, unless a person is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Truly, I tell you, unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, all of you must be born from above. John 3, 3-7, ISV. Jesus clearly states that one must be born from above, or again. The first birth earthly, terrestrial, and purely material as a son of Adam is not sufficient if one is to be part of the kingdom of God. Paul elaborates on this concept when he states concerning our physical bodies. For the trumpet will sound and the dead, physically, will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible body must put on incorruption and this mortal body must put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15:52 through 53 so, too, Jesus explains to Nicodemus that we are naturally born, corrupted, physically and morally, and a new birth is absolutely necessary. Paul supports this claim by stating, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 he also says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Galatians 6.15 There is simply no way that our current bodies and souls can enter into God's presence as is. We have to start over. However, starting over means that we become a direct creation of God, Ben Elohim, as well as continuing to be a Ben Adam. The bottom line is that we have a new nature when we are born again by believing in his name. Jesus states this concerning our new nature and future nature. See Luke 20:36. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Paul also states, Romans 8:14, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. He also says, Galatians 3.26, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. The reverse of Paul's statements are that if one is not led by the Spirit, then he is not a son of God. And also, if one is not in Christ, then he is not a son of God. All who are not sons of God have only been born once as sons of Adam. Without the second birth as a son of God, one cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Thus, before the cross of Jesus, there were no sons of Adam, bene Adam, that is, humans, who were also sons of God. The right for humans, bene Adam, sons of Adam, to become sons of God, only occurred after the finished work of the cross. Therefore, all references to sons of God in the Old Testament, that is to say, before the cross and resurrection, were angels. They were angels because they were direct creations of God. The conception and birth of Jesus to make us into sons of God was only half of the promise that God made to Adam and Eve. He said that her seed would be the one to destroy the enemy. So when God spoke of your seed to Satan, we should expect that one will come who will be the opposite of the Messiah. We have seen that seed is used to refer to sperm or ovum, gametes, or genetic material. Jesus, speaking of his incarnation, was the perfect fusion between heaven and earth. Given that her seed found such a literal and precise fulfillment, should we not then look for an equally literal and precise fulfillment concerning Satan's seed?